just to let you know, in case you were unsure, we are recording. And once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Los Angeles Spurters webinar for July 30th. It's going to be an exciting webinar. And if you have not been with us, you have missed the best jokes of the season. Terns are a very, very rich species to talk about, shall we say. Um, uh, thank, if you're a member, thank you very much for being a member and helping support webinars like this one. Uh, recording, uh, excuse me, putting recordings of webinars on our website for everyone to use. Supporting community um, community service projects that we take care of and support such as Project Phoenix. And um, so please, if you're not a member, you're if you're watching this in other places or on recording, please consider becoming a member. It's inexpensive and uh, the support is wonderful and it is tax deductible. And with that, I, with that, excuse me, I would like to introduce Kimball Garrett, who will introduce our speaker for, for tonight. Kimball. Okay, thank you, Ron. Um, well, I'm very pleased to introduce our presenter, Calvin Bond, the star of tonight's elegant turn of events. Calvin's passion <laughs> for birding began at the tender age of eight, and by the time he was 10, he was already leading bird walks around coastal Los Angeles sharing his enthusiasm and his knowledge with others. Calvin graduated from high school this past spring and in this fall he'll attend UC Davis, focusing on wildlife and conservation biology. Calvin's always shown a deep commitment to conservation. Sandwiched between his birding outings, he has volunteered with surveys for the least terns and snowy plovers. He's an active docent for the Friends of the Biona Wetlands. And currently he's honing his skills in bird specimen preparation at the Moore Laboratory of, of Zoology with an internship there. As a dedicated member of Los Angeles Birders, Calvin serves on the board and manages the or, or organization's Instagram page. He's also a founding member, as you just saw, of Los Angeles Birders students. Uh, with that group, he leads field trips, mentors, peers, co-authors, the student newsletter, and delivers scientific presentations. Calvin's dedication to community engagement and his advocacy for inclusivity and respect shine through in his interactions with both community members and his fellow students. Calvin's unbridled energy and many contributions are truly remarkable, as are his leadership skills. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Calvin Bond, who will be giving royal treatment to 10 tremendous turns. Thank you so much, Kimbo, for that really nice introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Hopefully, I am sharing my screen. Um, actually, let me stop sharing so I remember to share sound. Okay. Here we go. Um, I'm very excited to be talking about turns tonight. I love turns uh, for a couple of reasons. One, uh, they're loud. And two, they're easy to see. So it's a really, they're a really accessible group of birds for beginner birders. And they also have a really, really fascinating history and conservation in the state of California. So I'm really excited to share all of that for you. Uh, just to note, you will see lots of photos in this presentation. The worst ones are mine and the ones that are labeled are from some of you in the audience, but I got them off of eBird. So thank you so much. Um, okay, for, we're gonna start with some quizzes just right off the bat. You can test yourself. And then we're gonna go to an introduction about the turns as a group. And then we're gonna look at the 10 most common turns with special looks at the most complicated identification challenges uh, in the region. We're gonna have a fun time looking at some rarity, rare turns in the state. And then we'll go to some questions. Uh, so without further ado, here's the first quiz. Ron, if you could launch the small turn quiz, that would be great. How's so that? Thank you, perfect. If you guys are on Zoom, you should be able to see this and you can vote uh, for which one you see. So we'll give you. And yeah, for those of us who are on YouTube, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry you can't vote, I wish you could. But the options for those on YouTube are Black Turn, Forster's Turn, Common Turn, Arctic Turn, and none of the above. Thank so you, we'll yeah. let the votes come in for a little bit. 
Yeah, we're doing great right now. Uh, looks like the voting is slowing down. If you haven't decided yet, please make your decision in five, four, three, two, one. And thank you. Here are the results. Do you want the results now, by the way? Yeah, let's see the results. Let's see where we stand. Okay, great. None of you knew, knew it was black turn. So good job. It's not a black turn. Um, Forster is definitely in the lead. Good job. Common, Arctic, and none of the above are trailing behind that. So we'll talk more about this bird in the uh, later on. But for now, good job. It is a Forster's turn. Great. Now we're going to go to the next quiz. Uh, if you could re-release the small turn quiz, that would be great. A re I mean, re-release? Yeah, do the, or oh, sorry, oh, pull okay. the small turn quiz again. Okay. Relaunching. Okay, same options, Black, Forsters, Common, Arctic, and none of the above. Um, so take a take a good look at this, this turn in flight. This is a photo from Mark. <clears throat> oh, and looks like it's slowing down. Let's, if you haven't voted yet, let's vote in five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. Okay, so no Forsters. Good job. Um, Arctic common is in the lead, 63%, and then Arctic and black are behind. Good job. This is a common turn. Excellent. Here is quiz three. This is going to be the large turn poll. Okay. And here we go. Large okay. turns. The, this is the large churn poll. The options are Gull Build, Elegant Royal, Caspian, and none of the above. Take your, take your guesses. There's a joke in there somewhere, but I can't find it. <laughs> it's okay. We're trying to turn down the jokes for now. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like uh, it's slowing down. If you haven't voted yet, please vote in five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. Excellent. Royal is in the lead, 54%, followed by Elegant, then Caspian, and then Gullbuild. Um, Good job. This is a Royal. We'll talk more about why later. Great job, cool. y'all. And then finally, this turn, uh, maybe a little more challenging, we'll see. Um, it's going to be the large turn quiz again. OK. Launching polls isn't quite as intuitive as you would hope. Well, thank you so much, Ron, for, for sticking with it. This, hopefully you <laughs> all in the audience think this is fun. I think these are a fun part of the webinar for being I think here. it's but. Same, same options, Gull Build, Elegant Royal, Caspian, none of the above. Well, let's get those last votes in. And if you haven't voted, do so, please, in five, four, three, two, one. And here are the results. Okay, great job, y'all. Caspian with 63% of the vote followed by minimal numbers of gold build, elegant, and royal. Good job, this is a Caspian turn. So you have seen, gotten a preview of eight of the turns so far with these quizzes, with the eight options. But now we're gonna look at all 10 tremendous turns that I have promised y'all this evening. Um, these are the 10 species of turns that occur annually in California, some more common than others, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, from left to right on the top, we have least turn, black turn, common turn, arctic turn, forester's turn. And then from left to right on the bottom, we have gull bill turned, 
Elegant Turn, Royal Turn, Caspian Turn, and Black Skimmers, which are in the Turn family, despite not having Turn as the last name. So to take a little closer look at this, I, here's the genre that, that we go, that they divide into. For the 10 turns, there's actually seven genre, as you can see here, which makes it pretty diverse area for turns in California. The, where we run into identification challenges are the Sterna turns, Forster's Common Arctic, and the Thalassus turns, Royal and Elegant. Uh, I'm sorry to anybody who speaks Latin. Uh, but we have these, we're going to focus on these, so hopefully iron out any uh, identification challenges that we, you may have with these uh, turns. So first of all, here's a size comparison of the smallest turn being least to the largest turn being Caspian. And the you can see here at the bottom, this is a picture, they're in the same frame. They're, they're pretty, pretty, the size difference is very evident in here. But size can also be helpful uh, in determining the different species, like elegant and royal, despite being in the same gen, uh, gen the same genus, they ha are pretty different in size. Um, and also, uh, this surprised me because I've seen one gold bull turn in my life, and uh, they are much closer to the Forster's Arctic common turn size than the I thought they were. I thought they were huge, but I stand corrected. Um, so here is the, their rate here in inches, roughly. Um, and this is based on a, the values from Birds of Southern California guide. Um, you will notice later on, these are, I believe, from wing tip to tail, or sorry, bill to tail. So some of the features we're going to talk about in, in size don't exactly play out like here, but this, keep this in mind so you have a general idea going forward what we're talking about when we talk about the turns. So I also have some status and distribution graphs here from eBird for all 10 uh, turns throughout the year. Uh, the three on the top are birds that are here breeding and lingering uh, a little bit into the fall, well, a lot bit into the fall for elegant turns, but uh, they nest here. The three in the middle are more common in the fall. They don't really, they don't, none of them nest on the coast. Uh, and then we have four turns that are year round on the coast with some surges around breeding season, um, but that could also just be a reporting uh, reporting thing. Um, but this is helpful. I'm gonna point you to elegant versus royal again right here. Elegant really is not here during the winter, like December through February. Uh, if you find an elegant turn that you think you think you find an elegant turn, take pictures and report it to eBird because that is more unusual. I also have this for the salt and sea. Um, I'm very not familiar with the turns as much as the salt and sea. So this is where a lot of my research went into. Um, it's kind of interesting. The uh, Some turn species are way more common at the salt and sea, like gullbilled and black tern in the summer. But black tern actually don't nest at the salt and sea, really. They mostly just come after their, like in migration or after especially like post-breeding dispersal from other inland lakes. Um, but gullbill tern, black skimmer, and black tern only are, are there, you know, more in the summer and a little bit into the fall. Uh, Caspian and Forsters, they're year round, they nest there. Um, and then these other ones are much rarer. Common tern in the fall, you see that surge of when they're migrating through, you'll get some of the inland records there. But the other ones really, you don't expect them at the Salton Sea. There's actually only three royal tern records from the Salton Sea, um, so which I thought was interesting. Okay, so here is, we're gonna go into the species accounts now. So starting off with least turn. Um, these are, I think one of the, the coolest turns because they're so tiny um, and they are actually endangered in California. The, we have the brownie subspecies um, and they are federally endangered uh, in California. The also are the smallest turn. And they're here from April to August. They breed near colonies of other terns, like Bolsa Chico, you'll have some nesting, and you know, in the San Diego Bay, you'll have some nesting, but they're more separate from other terns. They're more mixed, often mixed with like snowy plovers in there, uh, which is why bo both of them are endangered and threatened, respectively. Um, they're not a big identif identification challenge in the state because they're so small. 
and they when you see them flying around i don't know i think they look like very much like bats they sort of just wing all over the place it's they're very they're very entertaining to watch um so but since they're not that big of a identification challenge in their adult plumage here are some cute turn pictures to look at because i think they can kind of be mistaken in the juvenile plumage when they're fledglings and chicks for uh baby snowy plovers which are which i have here on the bottom right but here's some just cute turn baby turn pictures to lighten up your evening um, starting with a few day old chick on the left side going all the way through a fledgling on the right side on the top and then down here in the bottom left picture you actually have three turn chicks i don't know if you can see my cursor um but uh, there's they're to the left of the adult turn sort of hiding in the bush and yep. their camouflage you can okay yeah we do awesome thanks ron uh their camouflage to blend in with sort of the plants and the uh, the driftwood and stuff, sand that would be on a beach in one of their nesting areas. So uh, if you see them running around, uh, you might see snowy plover chicks with them. This is a snowy plover chick from the same time that these turned pictures were taken from Malibu Lagoon actually, from, from when they nested there in 2017. Uh, but the snowy plover chick has longer legs, short black bill, and they they you know usually are near adult snowy plovers too, uh, which can be a good clue. Um, but yeah, here's some nice turn pictures. I don't have good cute turn pictures for any of the other ones really. So soak in your baby turns now. Uh, moving on to black turns. It's another small turn, but uh, decently larger than the least turn. Like if you see them next to each other, uh, it, it, the black turn would definitely look bigger. Um, they are seen in LA County, Paiute Ponds in May, really the only consistent chance you have at seeing black terns. Sometimes they migrate offshore and fall for a little bit, uh, but the big place in Southern California to see them, Southern California to see them is at the Salton Sea. Again, migration and summer when they're not breeding there, but they'll be there in pretty big numbers. And sometimes they show up other places. I think there was one at Malibu Lagoon recently, um, but yeah, for in general, they're more inland. In Northern California, they actually do nest at some of the uh, inland sites uh, in like the North, North Nevada, Oregon border, and then a little bit in the Sacramento Valley, I believe. Uh, but it, they're actually a state species of special concern there because they're not super common um, up in their breeding colonies. But breeding plumage, not really a identification problem. They're very, they, they fit their name. They're very black. Uh, on their bodies. They do have a white undertail and rump, which is something just to, you know, keep in the back of your head. And when we start talking about some of the rarer terms, they'll have the silvery, 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 silvery wings. Um, and, in, but in non-breeding, they can be, they're more similar to other terms because they become white below. And they, I think of them more as like an earmuff pattern on the neck, where that's more like, it's more, set closer to the back of the head and the nape than a lot of like, like the forehead patterns that you'll see coming up. Um, and then the juveniles are sort of brownish on the back here. Um, but otherwise there's uh, the non-breeding and the juvenile and immature birds will look pretty similar. Um, as you can see here, this is often how you'll see turn the black terns in Southern California. This is from the Salton Sea. A picture that somebody took and you, they go all the way from you know pretty black but starting to lose some white on their face to like completely non-breeding um, where they'll just be all gray uh, but it's kind of cool here to see uh, these are all black terns and they have a pretty large variation when they're molting but um, yeah again not a huge identification problem uh, in the state. Uh, moving on to the sterna terns, we'll start with Forster's turn because these are the expected sterna turn uh, along the coast. Um, and this should be like top of mind when you see a sterna turn, you should think, okay, why is this, why is this not a Forster's if you are trying to make it, in, uh, trying to see if it's something rare? Um, okay, it breeds and winters along the SoCal coast, not really a pelagic species. Sometimes you'll get a few mixed in with like common terns offshore but they're in general more inshore, coastal, and then in the interior a little bit. Um, year round, they have the longest legs and the longest bill of the California sterna 
species. And they also have the whitest edge to the outer tail feather. We'll look at this a little more later. This isn't a great field mark, um, like, but if it's, it can be like a supplemental field mark um, to when you're making your identifications. Breeding, they have this orange bill with the black tip. Um, li, um, variable amounts of black in the primaries, but it can be they can be very, very white in the primaries. Um, and they're all white below. They're not gonna get any of like the grayish tinge that a common or an Arctic might get in breeding plumage. Non-breeding, it's kind of important to note here that they molt into their non-breeding winter plumage in like pretty early by like mid to late August. So that can be a good uh, identification feature when you see a turn with a still pretty dark cap and it's like September, then you should definitely take another look at that turn. Um, they have this very isolated black ear patch, which keep in mind uh, for, this is our quiz photo. So this dark ear patch that's not really connected back to the nape, um, it's, that's a really, really good uh, feature for Forster's turns. Um, to me, it almost looks like a panda or a raccoon. It's like very heavy and around the eye and goes a little bit in front of the eye. Um, but even here, you can see in this inset photo by Riley Daniels, um, where the there's this is like a an example of when it's more variable in the back, but it's still most concentrated dark around the eye, like a raccoon. Um, and this is like in winter, they can get this black sort of on the back of their nape. Um, but don't be tricked. Um, also, they have no carpal bar. So I'll have a couple more pictures later, but carpal bar is this, uh, would be on the uh, inner part of the wing closer to the body on the front edge of the wing here. And it's very light, um, not, not really gonna see any sort of dark carpal bar in a forester's turn. Um, I'm gonna just go through the forester's common Arctic first and then we'll look at them side by side. So here's common terns. They're seen offshore, primarily in fall, and uh, rarely but regularly along the coast. Every year you'll see a couple mixed in with flocks at you know, San Diego Bay or Bolsa Chica. Already this year they've seen some mixed in at those flocks. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, primarily July through October uh, in Southern California. They have longer bills and longer legs than an Arctic turn, but shorter than a Forester's turn. And the outermost outermost retrici, I think, uh, the outermost tail feather is gonna have a black edge, a darker edge to it, um, which we'll again, look at again when we look at common versus Forester's turn. Um, in breeding, they have a sort of reddish base of the bill with a black tip. And they'll have, some times they can show like a, almost a slight gray wash below. Um, and they'll have blackish primaries, uh, especially when they're molting in the fall. When they molt, like this bird on the bottom here, uh, you can see some of the black coming up farther into the wing, both on the top of the wing, and then it's a messy black line uh, on the underside of the wing. It's not going to be super crisp and thin like it would be in an Arctic turn necessarily. Uh, Non-breeding, most of the time you won't see it like the non-breeding birds will be mostly like leaving the leaving the winter south of the U.S. and Southern California. But in late fall, if you're out in the ocean, you might see some in non-breeding. They just have like a whiter forehead um, and like not a complete black cap and the bill turns darkish. Uh, immature birds will have a dark carpal bar. So this is a very good the best field mark for common terns because most of them in California show up in this plumage, the one on the very top, where they have this dark bar that's even visible on the folded wing um, and a black that connects behind the nape and is pretty pretty dark behind the nape too, not necessarily like that raccoon pattern that the Forster's turn have. Um, and you can also see on this extended bird, this was a quiz, extended wing here, this was a quiz photo too. You'll have a dark carpal bar uh, on the immature birds. And they, they'll keep this like first, first winter, first summer, they'll have this for a while. Um, and you also want to look at the gray in the secondary. So this is going to help separate them from an Arctic turn. Um, see here along, these are the, these are the secondaries here, and they're a little bit darker. They're going to, they're not going to be white like they will be in an Arctic turn. 
Okay, moving on to Arctic terns. These guys migrate past California. They're, they're gonna be well offshore. So not really, they sometimes will show up along the coast or you know, rarely at the Salton Sea or somewhere else inland, uh, but mostly they're migrating, you know, they have the longest migration, debatably, they used, to, their former claim to fame was the longest migration in the world, all the way from uh, the Arctic for breeding to the Antarctic in the winter. And that take that route takes them past California, usually in the fall. Um, and here we'll have big flocks of them offshore in August to October. They have, if you see one sitting on a beach, like you are lucky enough to find the one on a beach, they are going to be, um, they're going to have really short stubby legs, almost like, un, almost like no legs. They are very short legs. And the bill is a little more variable, but it's going to be thinner and a little smaller than a common turn. Um, they're going to have a short head projection, so that means like almost no neck but they also are gonna have more like rounded head and that comes from that having like more of a steep forehead. Um, I'll point that out in the next slide too. Um, and they have a long tail if you see them in flight and they also will have the thin black edge to the primaries like a common turn. In breeding, their bill is red with no black tip. That is what's gonna separate it from breeding common turn and grayish below. To me, they also look like this like white bordering the black cap just stands out as like very crisp in a lot of the photos I looked at. So uh, that's something to pay attention to. Uh, same thing in non-breeding, they sort of get a darker bill, a more white on the forehead. It's not a full cap. Um, and then immatures, they do have a carpal bar. Uh, they do have a carpal bar unlike a Forster's turn, but it's gonna be more faint and not as bold as a uh, as a common turn. And sometimes it's pretty, it can be pretty variable. You can get some birds that don't have, a, like have a very faint or uh, no carpal bar. And then in that case, you want to double check there uh, in the wing here, in the open wing, they have, their secondaries will be more white here. Um, and it can be really dramatic in some cases. Here it's, you know, a little more indescript but it's just white along the base of the, the trailing edge of the wing. And that's gonna be, that's different than the grayish here that's along the trailing edge of the wing in a common turn. Okay, this was something cool, a little aside uh, for a moment. Uh, something cool that I found was when I was looking through eBird, combing through eBird for all these good uh, Arctic turn photos, I found uh, this example of when one instance where they like roosted on the beach for a couple of days in a row in Pismal Beach in the fall, where it was like hundreds of Arctic terns just on the beach. This does not usually happen. I just want to emphasize this is like a rare occurrence, but it was super cool. And people were reporting thousands over the water. I'm looking at this photo, just like, I wish to see this at some point in my life. Uh, but it's really impressive. So I guess this is always something to keep in like the back of your mind. And if you're birding in the fall along the beaches and like central or central coast, it, maybe it could happen again. Um, but I also just want to point out there are some common turns uh, that we're seeing in this flock. I believe this is one here. Um, and but yeah, super super cool instance of Arctic turns in California. Okay, here's the Forsters versus common turns. Um, Forsters are on the left mostly common on the right, you see no carpal bar in these birds on the left. And that is because Forster's turns, um, no carpal bar. And then you also see this whitish edge to the outer tail feather. So they do have some dark in the tail, but the like the very outermost edge of this retrocy is gonna be lighter. Now compare that with a common turn here, the outer edge on the retrocy is gonna be dark. So something to look at also is carpal bar. Uh, and on these sitting birds, you have a carpal bar very evident here. And one forcer turn, two forcer turn, and then this common turn. I believe this is from Bolsa Chica. Uh, but again, that carpal bar stands out and that nape is very dark. The, the black does not concentrate it around the eye like a forcer's turn. Uh, and then here is a, a more adult plumage bird with just this reddish bill with the black tip. Um, and then this, the Forsters and Commons turns would mostly come into contact along the coast 
when there's commons mixed in with foresters. Um, in this case, you would you'd you know look try and like rule out why this isn't foresters. But then when you're out in the ocean, common terns also can be pretty far offshore where they will mix with like Arctic terns. And I guess Arctic terns can come inshore a little bit. Um, so you want to compare Arctic, which are now on the left, to common, which are going to be on the right. Um, the Arctic terns have this light inner webbing on the secondaries, uh, very white. They also have, the adults also have this very like fine, like almost crisp looking black line on their primaries, just the tips of the primaries. But they also do not have that, uh, their wings look very just like pretty uniform, which is nice. Uh, in the center, you see them, you know, when they're on the beach, uh, if you are lucky enough to see them on the beach, very stubby legs, stubby looking bill, round heads, more steep foreheads. The, the common terms here you can sort of see have more sloping foreheads, I guess, and more of a neck. And they also have the longer legs. So when you see them side by side, the, the common terns will stand taller than the Arctic terns. And then Forster's terns, if you come into that scenario, will stand taller than the common terns. Um, here again, you can see the dark secondaries on a common tern. And uh, again, the, the both Arctic and common have this black blackish nape. So that's not a super, super good distinguishing factor. Okay, here's the, the midpoint of the talk. Um, this is a small turns review slide where I have the top photo, I have um, a common all the way on the left, or sorry, a Forster's all the way on the left, and then a common in the center, and then an Arctic on the right. And this is just like the perfect photo of me. If you want to remember one thing that you need to take one takeaway from this talk, remember this photo. If you find them all on the beach, just boop, 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 like a little do, re, mi in a, in a line. Arctic is going to be the smallest, like the squattest looking turn because the short legs and the thin bill. Then you see this dark carpal bar on the common turn, a little bit longer legs, a little bit bigger bill than the Arctic turn. And then you see this raccoon eye mask on the Forster's turn, no carpal bar really. And then the longer legs, a little bit bigger than the common turn here. And in the back, this is an elegant turn for reference in winter plumage. On the bottom, this is a photo Mark has from the Paiute ponds. So uh, this is a little bit trickier because we haven't talked about black turns, which is this middle turn facing to the right here. Uh, this is a black turn. Uh, and this is smaller than the Arctic turn, which is all the way on the left side, and the Forster's turn here. Forster's turn, again, that's like raccoon eye mask, um, no carpal bar. This bird, you know, from this photo, it's kind of hard to tell that it's an Arctic turn, but from this photo, you can see a lot of white in this in these secondaries, and uh, the there, there was a thin line along the tips of the primaries, which points you more towards Arctic turn. But again, you can see it, uh, you can see them all in the same view here, which is pretty fun. And you have comparison, greater yellow legs and a dowager here. So you can see the size really well. This bird facing away from us, see how it has a white nape, that is a Forster's turn. Covering my bases here. Okay, moving on, gull bill turned. It's a mid-sized turn. It is, uh, I have it in the larger turn section just because five and five was easier. But you, this bird only is on the coast in San Diego, um, typically, and they also breed at the Salton Sea. Uh, the first documented Salton Sea colony was in 1927, but this might have just been the first time ornithologists went to the Salton Sea and found them in this part. Uh, but they definitely are newcomers to the San Diego area where they came and started nesting in the 1980s. Uh, mostly going to appear in the summer. Um, and they're not, it's not a huge population in San Diego. You're not going to see like thousands of gold bill terns ever. Uh, and they are pretty, they're monitored by just the turn researchers down in San Diego. Uh, they have this really dark, thick, like chonky looking bill. And that is because this is a gold bill turn. It is thicker like a gull's bill. Um, but that's because they don't really eat fish like most terns. They uh, actually go for crabs and other invertebrates mostly, but unfortunately in Southern California, they eat snowy plover and least turn chicks, which are again, uh, species of special concern or, or federally threatened, federally endangered. So not great to 
you know, this was the, the, that's another reason why they're monitored because the they want to see how they interact with the least turn starry clovers that are also nesting in the San Diego Bay area. They have been seen away from San Diego. Uh, they there's been a couple at Bolsa Chica and I believe other places in between Bolsa Chica and San Diego over the years. Uh, but this would be really rare if you're not in like San Diego Bay, Tijuana River area, or at the Salton Sea where they nest. In non-breeding plumage, they're really not going to be in the U.S. for this plumage, but they sort of look like this juvenile here at the bottom, just like a dark cheek, sort of like a Forster's turn. Okay, um, here we have black skimmers. This is another turn that is not going to be confused really with any other turn in the state. They're just so cool. Um, look at this bill. This lower mandible is lower than the upper mandible, and that's because they skim for to eat. So they'll just drag the lower mandible along the, the bay, inlet, whatever they're fishing on. And when they feel fish, snap it shut, and they'll catch. Then it's, it's really cool it, to see, watch them forage like this. Um, they are year round on the coast. They're concentrated around their colonies during the breeding season, but then you can get flocks away from the colonies like Long Beach, um, Summit Biona sometimes, like in the LA area in the winter. Um, but most, they're, they're going to be just sort of wandering around in the winter and then go back to the colonies at like Bolsa Chica, San Diego Bay, uh, Long Beach Harbor. Uh, these are another newcomer to the birding avifauna of Southern California, because the first salt and sea colony was in 1972, and San Diego, they nested in 1976. And since then, they've been pretty consistent in both places. They expanded into Orange County, Bolsa Chica, I believe in the 80s. I can double check that. Um, and they sort of, they do nest on the islands with the large terns, uh, like the elegant, the royals, but they're sort of more on the edges, like when the elegant terns were really nesting at Bolsa Chica in the massive numbers, you could always tell where the skimmers were because they have all the dark back. They're the only really like black backed large terns like this. So they really stuck out on the edges of the colonies. Um, black above, white below, they have this uh, huge honking orange and black bill. In breeding plumage, their cap sort of, or sorry, in winter, their cap sort of becomes more speckly and uh, recedes a little bit, uh, but still really, really cool, uh, just amazing birds. I love them. Moving on to elegant terns, which are uh, in California, another mid-sized tern where these guys are co commonly confused with royal tern because they share a genus. Uh, and they are, these guys mostly in the summer. So breeding from March, so spring, I guess, through mid-November, that's spring to fall, but it's because they're nesting in Bolsa Chica in San Diego, and they're also coming north from their Isla Raza colony in the Gulf of California. Um, these guys first nested in San Diego in 1959 and had pretty consistent colonies since then, um, except for when a drone crashed at Bolsa Chica and scared all the birds Scared, scared all the terns to, they relocated to Long Beach Harbor that year. That was when the baby chicks were falling off the barge and like international bird rescue, they had to go and, you know, rescue all these baby chicks all the time. Really traumatic because the Bolsa Chica colony before this was seeing somewhere between 30,000 and 40,000 terns nesting. Um, and after, after that, I think the highest count that anybody's had of them not like the researchers, but anybody has reported on eBird there this year was 1,250. So much, much lower than, you know, I was, I'm guessing most of you saw Bolsa Chica in its heyday with the turn just wheeling all around. Uh, not as much during the breeding this year. I, I, t I went and I only saw two elegant turns when I was there. I understand now that there's been more and more regularly. So if you come on Sunday for the turn and walk, hopefully we'll see some good elegant turns there. Um, you want to look at them this like long thin orangish to yellow bill and we'll look at that more closely. Sometimes they get pinkish in breeding plumage. Um, this is sort of a bird that's like this. They can be a little pinker even um, when they're in like high breeding condition. They can get like this pink color like at the right at the beginning of the season and that's really cool. Like look look at them when they're coming back in like March 
uh, it's really something to see. Uh, compare this with royal tern, which are, I would say, a large tern. They are 20 inches about, they, they tower over the elegant terns when you see them side by side. They are year round on the coast, concentrated in the colonies in the summer, and then they have large loafing flocks in the winter. Like I live in Redondo. If you go out to Redondo or Hermosa, Manhattan, you walk there, you're almost guaranteed to see a flock of royal terns in the winter. And that's, it's so exciting because you'll be walking along, it's just gulls, and then you say, oh, terns. And then you can pick through them and see if there's any elegance lingering there. But they are the more common of the two during the winter months. Um, they also are newcomers to California, uh, first nested in San Diego, 1959, 1960, but then they had this big gap and then they came back again in the 1980s and that's when they were successful and started like establishing themselves again. Three Salton Sea records from the north end of the Salton Sea actually. Um, and so not really something you're looking for, you're expecting at the Salton Sea. You can look for them all you want, um, but yeah, if, they, if they're at the Salton Sea, that's actually really rare and you want to get photos of that. Um, you can tell, like, the biggest thing that people tell you about this is the chunky orange red bill. Um, they, it's much thicker than an elegant tern. And the SoCal colonies are not as large. They're not, it's primarily elegant terns and they'll nest, be sprinkled in within there. But they are actually, like, increasing. I, I remember just looking up one of the San Diego colonies they reported like, I think 150 royal terns nesting in there with the elegant terns. That was actually one of the highest counts they'd had in a while. Uh, or, yeah, like since they started nesting there. So this, this species is doing pretty well in California at the moment. Um, so here we have elegant versus royal. This is side by side. This is trying to get, you know, everything you would get in a book and more. Um, elegants are gonna be smaller. This is the bird facing to the left. Royal terns are gonna be larger. The bill color on an elegant is going to have a darker base that usually orange that fades to a more yellowish tip. Um, on a bill color on a royal, it's mostly orange or red fading to a little bit lighter tip, uh, but there's much, it's much less of a gradient in royal turns a lot of the time. Uh, bill shape, the elegant turns long, thin, slightly down curved. Uh, royal turns, it's chunkier, thicker. And they, a lot of times I notice this, they have a more pronounced like gonadal, go, gonadal, gonadal angle uh, on the lower part of the uh, bill. So that's, well, I'll show you another example of this in a second, but it's this more like steeper angle on the lower mandible. And usually you use, when you're talking about this, you're talking about like gall identification. Um, but here, I think it's just something to keep in mind on a lot of terms. Um, non-breeding pattern, the eye on an elegant turn, these are both in breeding, so not in this picture. Ooh, let me go back. The eye is usually connected to the black on the crest and the nape. Um, and the non-breeding on royal, I usually find that the eye is like disconnected from the black crest, but this is pretty variable. Not a recommended, like that shouldn't be your only thing that you use to determine royal versus elegant. And then again, time of year. March to mid-November, really, and like tapering off on either end of that. So uh, be aware that elegance in the winter is not common and you should get pictures of that. Uh, and time of year, royal, pretty year round along the coast. Okay, let me, let me show you the sounds too, because that is something that you want to pay attention to. Ooh, hold on. I really owe Paul Marvin a, a, some thanks here because he he recorded both the elegant and royal turns here. So take a listen. Okay, you should be paying attention to like the there it's gonna be higher pitched and it's a very emphasized second syllable, like Greek, uh, a lot of times. Let me play you the royal turn. Hello. There we go. Okay, hopefully that came through okay. Um, that one, it's a little bit more descend at the end. The second syllable isn't as accented. It's a little lower, a little like rougher. Um, but yeah, again, the elegant turn should be like kareek, 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 like a very two-syllabled, higher pitch, more like 
screechier and the royal turn more is like a more rolling it more like tapers off at the end instead of being like super accented um and that can be helpful if they're just flying around and you're just listening to them um also a plug here a lot of elegant like elegant turns last summer i was talking to somebody who worked with like merlin bird id and elegant turns were not in merlin bird id because they did not have enough recordings to you know build a good data set for the for merlin to be able to distinguish them from royal turns so i don't know if this is still the case but i know about half of the recordings of elegant turns that i found in macaulay library on a quick search today were all from paul marvin so i think we should all you know go out and start recording some more elegant turns and you know birds in general to help with the Merlin bird ID. Okay, that was my, my tangent, my aside. Moving on, here is, uh, the, this is looking more at the bill, the bill color here. Um, this is like the, the palest elegant and the palest royal, like the lightest color bill I've seen on these species on the top. And then on the bottom is like the darkest I've seen of these species where you get like a really dark reddish base almost on this elegant turn on the left and it fades like this yellowish tip. So that's like half the rainbow right there, just an elegant turns bake. Pretty impressive. This is a royal turn. And this one, when I was looking through my photos, I was like, wait, is that almost a Caspian? Um, because it's just, this is a very red, red orange. Uh, it's not a Caspian. Caspians would be, you know, more red and they would be all the same color. But we'll look at that again in a second. Um, and then also here's the, the go needle angle. Um, probably not pronouncing that right, but you have this like more like this more pronounced bend in the lower mandible. And you really don't see that on elegant turns because it's very thin, long, and like slightly down curved. Um, but that's on a royal turn, it's something that's you know a little more noticeable. So you should just keep that in mind. Um, here's the non-breeding plumage comparisons. Uh, see how the elegant turns on the left uh, have this black crest that you know runs down their nape but it's also very connected to the the black eye whereas here on the right the royal turns they have this most of them have this like very like evident dark eye like the eye really stands out on a royal turn because it's more disconnected from the white my dad calls this male pattern baldness uh pattern on the royal turns where they have just this like very white forehead, more white on the forehead um, than so much so that it pushes the crest back a little bit and it separates them from the eye. Just something to be aware of if you're looking at a turn and you're like not really sure where this falls. If you see them though in a mixed flock, they are pretty fun to pick apart. This was actually a flock from February at Bayona, so this like late February, but this was like a little unusual. I was not expecting when I was looking through these photos again to find an elegant turn hiding in the top left corner. Um, you can tell long straight bill, more lighter um, with these royal turns, primarily royal turns. And then same deal here where uh, the photo, we're starting with the photo on the right, it's all these royal turns. And then in the back, you can tell out of focus, but it's still definitely an elegant turn, longer, thinner, thinner beak, um, sort of a little bit smaller, although it's really hard to tell in this photo. Uh, but you can tell that in the photo on the left where they're flying, the elegant turns are the one on the top and the two on the bottom, and this royal turn is in the middle. Um, and that's, you can tell this based on size. Uh, the eye stands out pretty heavily on the royal turn's face. It has a bill that's, you know, not disappearing in the background of this grainy photo. So um, it's all pointing to royal turn and then these three are elegant turns. Uh, moving on to large, another large turn, Caspian turn. We're wrapping up here, so hang in there. Uh, Caspian turn, largest turn in California, and I believe the world, um, they are just massive. Year round resident here, they'll breed here, um, but they didn't always breed on the coast. They were usually more inland nesters, um, but the first salt and sea colony was again found in, found in 1927 uh, or described in 1927. And then the first San Diego colony in 1941, and the first Orange County colony in 1986. So much, they, these terns uh, were not they, they were always in California and were not like colonizing California, but their colonies were moving to the coast in California, uh, which is an interesting distinction. They have a thick blood red bill, 
there's not a lot of variation. It won't really look orange unless it's like on a juvenile. Um, and sometimes they have this dark tip that can sometimes be helpful because I, the, I've never seen like a pure, elegant or royal turn with a dark tip on the bill. Uh, they have large black wedges in the primary. So that's another thing. Like if a bird's flying really high in the sky, a turn's flying really high in the sky. And I'm like, I do, like, there's nothing around for size. If it has this big honking red bill and these uh, black wedges in the primaries, it's a Caspian turn. Um, and like, this, I've just seen them sometimes I, when they used to fly over Redondo more, uh, I'd just catch them flying and be like, oh, look, big black wedges in the wings, definitely a Caspian turn. Uh, the crown becomes more speckly in the winter. Um, sometimes though they re can retain it for like a while. Um, here's the last quiz photo. This is probably a top smelt fish, I believe. Um, but these like just massive black wedges in the primary on the underside and the red bill, even though the bird's flying away, you can definitely tell it's Caspian Tern. Um, and on the bottom, here's a photo of a juvenile Caspian Tern with this like speckly brownish, like arrow shaped pattern on the wing. Um, thanks Henry for this photo. Uh, this is like, this is pretty typical of like fresh year birds. This bird was at Bayona a couple weeks ago. Um, this bird is like pretty young. So uh, just keep an eye out. When you see juvenile terns, a lot of them will look like this, like if, like fledglings, birds that were hatched like that summer. A lot of them will have a lot of this sort of arrowy tan pattern, um, which can be uh, good to know and look out for in case you ever find, you know, breeding somewhere that they're not supposed to be. Um, here's the large tern wrap up. We have a mixed group here. Uh, Caspian terns are the largest. These are the ones on the right side of the photo and this guy on the bottom. There's another one back here by this rock. You have some elegant turns, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, six. Uh, these guys in the back here, elegant turns. And then this is a royal turn right here, um, a little bit bigger. They're standing a little taller, a little bit bulkier. And they, their bill is not like yellowish at the tip. It's more faded to orange at the tip. Uh, this guy, you know, sort of out of view here uh, on the left side is also a royal turn. But this is a pretty typical mixed flock you can get, like starting about now, when you get the royal turns, elegant turns, Caspian turns, all just leaving the breeding colonies, sort of just loafing around the area, or when they're headed to their breeding colonies in like March. This is, to keep your eyes out, they, they will mix around pretty often. Um, so hopefully this talk is helps, helps with that. So now here's my like science bit of the evening. Um, I, they, like you saw a lot of them, they were nesting the, along the coast. That was like a new thing and they didn't used to happen before. So I found this really cool study from like 1983 and it was mainly detailing the first successful nesting of a royal tern in, Cal in the San Diego. Um, in the San Diego colony, and, but they had some really cool, uh, they, they were talking about how the terns got to California and the elegant terns, remember they started along the coast in the 1959 and then in the 60s was when they really established the colonies. They, their populations were really cor correlated to Northern anchovies stock, at least initially along California coast. That's like what caused them to come up from the Mexican colonies into California. Royal terns, they found, this uh, author found that the royal terns were more coordinated with Pacific sardine abundance historically. Like that's why there was a couple nesting records in 1959, 1960 was because the Pacific sardines were coming up the coast. And then again, why there was a big absence in the 1980s was when they started coming back, tied mostly to Pacific sardines, they thought. But then later they decided that it was mostly inshore and juvenile fishes that were, you know, mostly su what supplemented the royal terns after they, after they came north from their colonies. Caspian terns, uh, the alteration of inland nesting areas from 1910s to 1940s, um, like dredging for agriculture and uh, just destroying a lot of the old colonies and like draining inland lakes where they might have nested, led to the formation of the coastal colonies 1940s in San Diego and 1980s in Orange County. And they, uh, this author, author actually thinks that the Caspian Terns presence was part of what allowed the Elegant Terns and Royal Terns to you know, establish colonies in the same spots as Caspian Terns 
because the casting tour turns sort of uh they're big and they are their presence already there could help them you know scare away some predators stuff like that and then why did the fish change in california during this time there was warmer waters in the in the 1959 there that that period there was a warm el nino season and then again in the 80s that really helped the well not helped that's part of what the changes in the El Nino caused the warmer waters on the eastern side of the Pacific, which causes changes in fish patterns. So it makes the colder water fishes move north away from the equator. Um, and that, you know, is what we saw with the elegant royal turn sort of following the food um, in this example, at least according to this author, I thought it was a really good explanation. I, I, I like this, this trend that the, they saw here, Fred, Fred Schaffner saw here. Um, so I trust it. Um, now we're going to go into a little bit of a fun detour from 10 tremendous turns, try 14 turns. These are all the turns that have been seen in California. Um, okay, starting strong on the top left, this is a sandwich turn. They have nine records in California, but only three birds. A lot of these were like returning records that were like, uh, they were coming to the Bolsa Chica colonies and like trying to nest with elegant turns there. Um, from the record span from April to July, but the last record was actually in, I believe 19, and then last accepted record was I believe 1987. Um, but they, after that, you know, we have a lot of talk about hybrids with elegant turns, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, but sandwich turns, uh, they're in the same family as elegant and royal turn, or same uh, genus, John, genre as elegant and royal turns. Um, and they a pure sandwich turn will have all black bill with this sharp yellow tip at the, at the very end. Um, we also have city turns, which there are 17 records and 14 birds, mostly from like the eighties, uh, from birds coming in San Diego up to Bolsa Chica. There's actually 11 records at Bolsa Chica. Some of them involve multiple birds, like there was three birds there one year. Um, you're like, if you want to identify a sooty turn, you're looking at this uh, compared to like a bridal turn down here, you're looking for this dark back and you they'll also have a dark underwing in flight and that will not contrast with the dark cap compared to a bridal turn, which is, will have this like grayish back and they'll have lighter underwings that contrast with the black, black cap here. Bridal turn, six records spanning four birds, um, again, May through August. Most of these guys are going to be uh, summer and fall birds um, that that ended up in California. Then of this group, we have and the outlier white wing turns. There's two California records. Both of them are from Northern California. This is where I said keep in mind black turns can be like white wing turns look very similar to black turns. You're just looking for this white on top of the tail too. These whitish wings and very distinct white. Uh, white underside of the primaries contrast with like the black inner wing uh, area here. Sort of think like a turkey vulture pattern. Uh, I don't know if that should pop into my head, but yeah, Northern California records for of birds from like the eighties that lingered for a couple months each. Um, so just, you know, keep your, keep your eyes open. Uh, they sooty and bridal turns have shown up at the Salton Sea. And actually the three except the white wing turn have all shown up, up at Bolsa Chica. So, uh, and then the San Diego used to be a good spot for these guys too. So keep your eyes open if you are out birding somewhere. Uh, I want to talk for just a sec about hybrids uh, because I love hybrids. There are no accepted sandwich records, I'm sorry, from 1997 because many pertain to elegant sandwich hybrids. So the, uh, there's this research uh, done on Isla Raza by two Mexican uh, biologists who uh, were talking about the percentage of turns in their study area that they thought were hybridized with elegant and cabots. Cabots is just the sandwich turn subspecies that's in, that comes to California sometimes. Um, and they said they found 15 birds that in their one study plot of like 750 something pairs um, and or 750 birds, they found that 0.05% of them showed some influence of uh, sandwich turn ancestry, which would manifest itself mostly in the bill because they're pretty similar size to elegant turns, maybe just a tad smaller. Um, but the bill, it's sort of black 
at the base and it blends into the yellowish at the tip um, where it's instead of like a bright yellow tip, it might be more yellowish orange tip. The bird on the top here is one of the, like one of the more sandwich turn evident parentage in the in the California hybrids here. Most of them look more like the bird on the bottom where it's more yellowish tip, like which, but that could be like an elegant or a sandwich turn. So it's mostly yellow on the tip and the 75, the three quarters of the bill that are closer to the bird are like a mix of black and orange. Um, and that's what they found in the hybrids on this island. A lot of them were just showing like flecks of black in the bill. Um, and I have heard that sometimes elegant turns can have black in the bill, but as like a, like a weird uh, aberrant color morph. Um, but the, the, I think a lot of these also might just pertain to hybrid ancestry of sandwich and elegant turn hybrids coming from either when sandwich turns nested with both, uh, elegant turns at Bolsa Chica or from like the Isla Rasa colonies. Uh, and these birds are again, something to look out for when you're combing through elegant turn flocks on the beach uh, and you see them with the dark bill, take lots and lots and lots of photos so you can try, uh, so we can learn more about that bird. Okay, quick acknowledgements. Uh, thank you to Lab S and Lab Board for sending me their photos and anybody who had turned photos on Macaulay eBird. And then I used a lot of research for this, uh, mostly Birds of Southern California Status and Distribution from Kimball and John, fabulous book. Uh, and then these were the two papers, the one on hybrid turns and one on the royal turn nesting that had the other turn information. Uh, very interesting. You can find them on Sora or Western Birds uh, and then uh, so check that out if you're interested, and then eBird for all the other data. Thank you, and hopefully we have some time for questions. I know I went a little bit over time, but uh, yeah, I'm going to stop sharing and questions. Wonderful. I, Thank I, you I so much. Enjoyed, I, I think we all enjoyed that so much. Thank you very much, Calvin. Yes. And yeah, um, we have a couple of questions that popped up already. Yeah, and if you have questions, please put them in the Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question uh, was from John: um, Is the scale from total length? I think you said, but oh, the, the, the scale on the sizes of the turns, I guess. Yes, that one was for from tail tip to bill tip. So uh, that one's that was you know not for like the the like Arctic common turns and four turns all in there where they have more different sizes that the tail and wing tip was what that one, the tail to bill tip was what that was measuring. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Uh, uh, is asking, does the anchovy you. diet cause a pink hue on elegant turns? turns? I'm not sure. I will research that and get back to you. That's <laughs> very interesting. I, I thought it was more of a breeding thing where they get this like breeding more blush in the when they're for fresh coming up here, like February and March, but I, I can double check on that. Okay. Wonderful. And um, that pinkish color only happens during breeding season, correct? Yes. Yeah, you won't really see one uh, in the, in the uh, uh, winter plumage with that. Okay. All right, Next. any more questions? While we have Calvin with us at the moment. So where are you going next year, Calvin? I'm going to Davis. Not a ton of turns nesting at Davis. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not next year. It's uh, next month, essentially. Oh, oh yeah, wow. Next month. <laughs> yeah, it's not next month. It's there next year. It's, not, yeah. it's a few wow. weeks. That's right. right. That is exciting. Is, is right. Davis on, on semesters or quarters? Orders, so I'll be I'll be going up in the middle of September. Okay, so it'll be it will be another yeah. Okay. Well, thank Very you, cool. Colin. That was really great presentation. And once again, you're you know proving that you are really a skilled birder and a remarkable um, individual for anyone of any age. And you're truly um, gifted. So we wish you luck. And Calvin still is a as a board member, and we're really proud of him. Oh, yes, absolutely. Fantastic presentation, and um, we had uh, quite a turnout. Um, uh, <laughs> and uh, and everybody remember that uh, that Calvin is uh, leading a turn trip at Bolsa Chica uh, this coming Sunday. 
Yeah. Yes. Hope to see you guys there. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. If you have any questions later, you can email me, find, you know, text, email the birders, LA birders, they can get to me. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. Hope this was fun. <laughs> Oh, it was Thank fantastic. You again, Calvin. Thank there you again, was a lot Calvin. of things going through in the chat also. Yes, yes. Lots and lots, lots of lots of kudos uh, to you, Calvin. Yeah, it turned yes. out well. Thank you all. <laughs> it, it it turned out well. <laughs> and on that so, note, so now yeah. now it's getting late and we're all gonna turn in. Turn in for the Mark, night. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and mute you right now if you don't mind. <laughs> we're gonna turn off the mic. Turn, turn me off. off. <laughs> and... <laughs> Leave the meeting. Oh, Thanks, boy, Calvin, boy, for a great boy. introduction uh, to uh, to Kimball for a great introduction of Calvin. Yes. Uh, all yeah, thank you for Kill yeah, Kimball's introduction was fantastic. And join us in a couple of weeks uh, for another exciting and riveting webinar from LA Burgers. Yeah, and we, I do we, mean exciting. And it's with the former uh, Los Angeles Birders, the student. Uh, he still uh, he still joins us, but um, yeah, he's an adult now, a uh, yeah. full adult. Yeah, he's now working at the Moore Lab. Yeah, he's working yeah, at the Moore Fantastic. Lab. Yep. So we'll see you on August thirteenth. We'll see everyone. Thank you all very much, and see you everyone on August thirteenth. Take care. Thanks, Calvin. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Now. bye. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs>